I want to greet you in the name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. A discipleship is the most important program uh, that God designed for his children. You will remember that the definition of discipleship is that it is, quote unquote, God's family training program. It's a program that God has designed for those who belong to his family, training them uh, in everything that relates to his family. Uh, uh, things like how to, the character of the members of his family, the ethics that they espouse as, as a family, the principles of the family, the purpose of the family, um, and so forth. It's a very important uh, program. Now, this week, uh, in this teaching, briefly, uh, I will describe the relationship between a disciple and a discipler. A discipler cannot be a discipler if he does not have disciples. Like a teacher cannot be a teacher if he has no students. Or a mentor cannot be a mentor if he has got no mentees. So once we speak of discipleship, we presuppose uh, two things. There is a discipler and there are disciples. Let's pray. I forgot to pray before we discuss this matter. Uh, our Father, we, and we know that discipleship is in your heart. And yet, uh, discipleship itself is not known as it is supposed to be known. There are a lot of misconceptions about it. Uh, there is under conceptualization of the concept of discipleship. There is even a, there is even cross distortion of it. We realize that it is the enemy who brings about this confusion because he does not want people to have a clear understanding uh, of discipleship. You have started then this program and we've got brothers and sisters on this interna international and interdenominational discipleship uh, group, these two groups. Thank you for the patience of people who belong to it. We want to grant us grace uh, to uh, to have programs, to ongoing programs, teachings on these two platforms. I want to pray for your blessings on the people on these two platforms. We want to thank you for their patience. Please, Lord, help us at least to have an offering, to have an instruction <clears throat> at least once a month, if not twice. 
uh, in the midst of a very tight and demanding schedule, we pray that uh, we will pray prioritize discipleship because it is a priority to you. Uh, bring clarity to, uh, to, to tonight's teaching. <clears throat> we pray for uh, understanding, correct understanding, and deep understanding of what we will be saying, rather what you will be saying. We thank you and we bless you in the name of Christ. Amen. <clears throat> we are dealing with discipleship. We are saying that in order for discipleship uh, to be discipleship as we find it in the Bible, <clears throat> it involves a disciple and it involves a discipler. We will talk next time about how this relationship between a disciple and a discipler is forged. That will be the next class. But now we want to explain that there must be a discipler <clears throat> and then there must be a disciple. <clears throat> now, when it comes to a discipler, I want you to understand what I'll be saying. Uh, every disciple has two disciples. That's very important to note that every discipleship has two disciples <clears throat> a human <clears throat> disciple and a divine disciple. In discipleship, we're discipled by Christ. Christ is the discipler of disciples. In fact, I would say that the triune God, the three in one God, uh, disciples a disciple. <clears throat> He is what we call an invisible disciple. I will explain how he does it. Uh, in fact, <clears throat> both the disciple, both the human disciple, and the human disciple. Both the disciple and the disciple, who are human beings, both of them are discipled by Christ. Let me show you a scripture that says that 1 Corinthians chapter 11. Uh, I pray you will follow this. Paul says, follow me. You will remember that we said that discipleship is followership. Uh, but following, not in this way of one is going in front and the other one is coming after, not in that sense. But following in a different sense, namely following the character uh, of God, following the lifestyle of Christ, who once lived on earth and left us an example to follow, following his lifestyle, following the principles of God, following the values of God, following the instructions of his word, in that sense of following. Uh, or another word that could be used is the word emulation. Uh, another word that is appropriate is the word conformity. So in discipleship, we emulate God. 
God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit. In discipleship, we are conformed to the likeness and image of God. <clears throat> there are scriptures that say that. We will uh, be looking at them as the Lord allows us to explain this. <clears throat> now, when you read 1 Corinthians chapter 11 and verse 1, we see three persons here. Um, it says, follow my example. He's speaking to the individuals in Corinth. The one speaking is Paul. He says, follow my example. Then he says, as I follow the example of Christ. So there are three people. There is Christ, who is a disciple of Paul, who is a disciple of the Corinthians. This Christ who disciples Paul also disciples the Corinthians. But this Christ has put a person they can talk to, they can touch, uh, they can reach out to, who is going to become an example for them, representing Christ. In other words, these people in Corinth must see Christ in Paul, and Paul himself uh, has the life of Christ. So he says, follow me, follow my example, as I follow the example of Christ. In the King James Version, it says, be ye followers of me, even as I also am of Christ. A follower is a disciple. So I've got three uh, people in discipleship. Christ, uh, the human discipler, and the disciple, those three. One is invisible, he's in heaven, he is also on earth through his spirit, he is invisible. The other one is visible. And there's a sense in which Christ himself is visible through the visible disciple. Let me repeat that. There's a sense in which Christ, who is in invisible is actually visible through the human disciple. <clears throat> uh, disciples must see Christ in the person they are following. When they fail to see Christ in him, they have a right to look over his life, over his head, to Christ, who is ahead of him. They are those three persons. What does that mean then? It means that a discipler who does not follow Christ in his character, uh, in his conduct, uh, in uh, his lifestyle, has no right to disciple people. Uh, he has no right to disciple people. He must disciple. He must disciple people after he himself has embodied the life of Christ. He must embody, he must embody the life of Christ. And Christ must be seen in him. 
So he conforms his character to that of Christ. And those who follow him see him conforming his life to that of Christ. And they too are encouraged to conform their character to that of Christ. So it is a very demanding thing to be a discipler. Not everybody must desire to be a discipler. If they were wise, they would not desire to be disciples until the character of Christ has been formed in them. Until those who follow him or her can clearly see Christ in his character. <clears throat> but here on earth, then, there are two people who are needed, is a disciple and a disciple. And these two have a relationship, one teaching the other about God, as God has been teaching him about himself. Now, throughout the scriptures, then, we find this too. We find a Moses who runs to Jethro's place because of the problems he has created in Egypt. He finds a man called Jethro who has been walking with God for some years, he stays in his house, and this man disciples him. Jethro disciples and Moses. But you'll notice that when you read um, Exodus and Numbers, particularly those two books, uh, more especially the book of Exodus, where Moses is first mentioned in chapter 1, you'll find that there's God in the background. Moses goes to the mountain. He speaks with God for 40 days and 40 nights. God tells him uh, how to do things on earth. God is very prominent. Now Moses himself, when he returns to Israel, to Egypt first, and then he takes the children of Israel out of Egypt, um, we discover uh, that Moses started to raise human disciples uh, who, H-U-R, uh, Aaron, his elder brother, um, Joshua, the young man, and many, many others that are mentioned. In uh, Numbers chapter 16, we find many people who are followers of Moses. In Numbers chapter 16, uh, the Bible speaks of Korah, uh, who was a follower of, 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 of uh, Moses, sorry. Um, we find many others that are mentioned here uh, who were followers of uh, Moses. So he had many followers. He was discipling them. He was teaching them. In fact, a scripture that is clearer on this um, is Exodus chapter 18, where Jethro had gone to see Moses, his disciple, his disciple, sorry, 
And then he finds him working ex extremely um, strenuously. And he tells him that what he's doing is not correct. He's going to kill himself and also kill these people following him. Then he says in verse 19 of Exodus 18, 18 and verse 19, he says, listen now to me, and I'll give you some advice. And may God be with you. You must be the people's represent, representatives. You must be the people's representative before God and bring their disputes to him. Then teach them this discipleship. In discipleship, this teaching is pupil teacher relationship. Teach them and the decrees and the laws of God. Show them the way. All those have to do with discipleship. You teach and you demonstrate. You teach and you show them the way. You show the way. Show them the way to live. That's discipleship. Uh, exemplify the kind of life that God expects of them. They must see that life in you. When he says, show them how to live, he is saying that demonstrate the kind of life. Demonstrate it, the kind of life they ought to live. They must see it in you. That's, that's classic discipleship. You teach them, you show them how to hear, you teach them the word of God. But this word of God that you are teaching them must be exemplified in your life. Show them the way to live. And then show them the duties they are to perform. The duties they are to perform then he says that he must establish a leadership structure uh, comprising of officials in their tens, in their fifties, in their hundreds, and in their thousands. Each group has a leader over them. Then these people will serve, will, will serve as judges for the people at all times, but have them bring every difficult case to you. The simple cases, they can decide themselves. They will do so because Moses will have taught them the law or the laws of God. That will make your load lighter because they will share it with you. Now, if you read very carefully uh, Exodus 18, verses 19 to 23, no, not even to 23, um, from verse 19 to verse 27, from verse 19 to the end of the chapter, we see Moses discipling the Israelites through those he himself was discipling. There were many levels of discipleship. The leaders that he discipled, who also discipled other leaders under them, who discipled the people um, according to families. The point I'm raising here is that discipleship will always a human will have a human, a discipler who exhibits the character of Christ whom he or she follows. And, uh, and yet 
the people that he disciples have access to the God that he's teaching them about. Uh, the discipler does not obstruct people from accessing God. Does not even obscure God from the view of the people. Rather than obscuring God from the view of the people, he reflects God. He or she reflects God. He or she mirrors God. Uh, so we've got disciple, disciples. Um, this is found throughout the scriptures in the Old Testament and in the New. Uh, we've got Jethro discipling Moses. Jethro is a discipler. Moses is a disciple. We have got Elijah, discipling Elisha. Elijah is a discipler. Elisha is a disciple. We have got Ruth, no, Naomi. Naomi, discipling Ruth. Naomi is a discipler and Ruth is a disciple. We have got uh, the priest Eli or Eli, E L I. Some pronounce it as Eli. Uh, discipling somewhere from childhood until he became a prominent, well respected prophet in Israel. In the New Testament, we've got Christ discipling his disciples, not only 12, but the 70 and the 140 uh, the disciples. Uh, we've got uh, Barnabas discipling Paul. After Paul uh, came to know Christ as his Lord, as his Lord and Savior, then uh, Barnabas took the, respon re the responsibility of discipling him. Then I've got Paul discipling many, many people. Can't finish counting them. Timothy is one of them. Titus is another, Philemon is another, um, Luke himself was discipled by Paul. <clears throat> We've got Onesimus, we have got Demas, we have got uh, Epaphras, E-P-A-P-H-R-A-S, Epaphras, we have got um, Epaphroditus. Then Peter discipled Mark. He was a disciple of Mark. So there are those relationships of disciple, discipler, disciple, discipler relationship. <clears throat> life is learned from life. You don't learn life from theory. Life is not learned that way. Life is learned from life. So a human discipler provides his own life as a, as a curriculum, as it were, as a curriculum from which others must learn. <clears throat> now, every discipler, every, every discipler is a disciple because they are disciples that he or she is discipling. <clears throat> if anyone does not have 
disciples, but he or she disciples. Then the Bible says, what that person do, he must make them. We get this in Matthew uh, 28, verse 19. <clears throat> verse 19 says, Therefore, go and make disciples of all nations. The key word, make. If you're going to be a disciple, uh, you must make disciples. It's your responsibility to make them. We will talk when we are dealing in the next <clears throat> uh, lesson on how the relationship between a disciple and a disciple is forged. We'll talk about the making. <clears throat> But what is interesting, though, please note these things. I'm trusting that you are taking your own notes. Uh, in Matthew 28, verse 19, the disciple must make disciples. Christ is instructing his disciples before he ascended to heaven that on earth they must make disciples. And it is called disciple-making. They must make disciples. And they must make this, this, these disciples in all the nations, he says, of all nations. Which means that the plus minus 56 nations that are found in Africa, and in fact, there are far more than 56 others have not been recognized by the United Nations. They have not received their statehood, but they are clearly a nation which is suppressed and colonized by another nation. Not discussing that. He said they must make disciples of all nations, uh, which means every nation must have disciples who have been made by the disciples of Christ. Then you go to chapter 4 and verse 19, uh, Matthew chapter 4 and verse 19, Christ says, come follow me and I will make you. I'll make you fishers of men, I'll make you disciples. So which means when he tells them in Matthew 28 and verse 19 to make disciples out of other people is because they themselves have been made. So a person who has not been made a disciple of Christ cannot make other people disciples of Christ. It's a misnomer. It's um, absurdity. Uh, it is wrong for someone who is not a disciple to someone else to venture out and make disciples of other people. You must be a follower before you can recruit other people to follow you. You must be a disciple before you can recruit other people to, to, to be discipled by you. I'm stressing the issue of a disciple. Um, a disciple will have disciples because this disciple has made uh, disciples. And because he has made some disciples and he is actually discipling them, then he can be a disciple. 
Uh, on the other hand, <clears throat> for one to call himself or herself a disciple, he must have a disciple. Just as a discipler cannot be a discipler without disciples. Also, disciples cannot disciples without uh, a disciple. A disciple is a disciple because he is a disciple. So if we ask you, are you a disciple? <clears throat> and you say, yes. The next question I should ask you, who is your disciple? Who is your disciple? And if you can't answer that question, you are not a disciple. <clears throat> now you may say that my disciple, my disciple is Christ. Yes, you may be right. But the way God has structured things, he will not accept you as a disciple unless you've got a human disciple. That's very important for you to note that. He will introduce you to someone to disciple you. He will cross your path. He will cause your paths to cross and he will orchestrate uh, the, the, the relationship that is required uh, for discipleship to take place. It's just like uh, needing a pastor and you are a congregant and a congregant is called the flock, the congregants. They are the sheep that follow the shepherd, and the pastor is called the shepherd. And the Bible says Christ is the chief shepherd. You cannot ignore an earthly shepherd and claim to be shepherded by Christ without having, a, having an intermediary, a person between you and Christ appointed, appointed by God himself. This is important, please understand this. Uh, please understand this, it's important. Life is learned from life. And now, <clears throat> whether we have talked about this, if we have not talked about this, we will talk about, about it. What is it? The fact that uh, God is a discipler, and then there is a human discipler as well. If I were to ask you the question, who do you prefer to disciple you? A human discipler or a divine discipler? I know that most of you will mistakenly say, I chose Christ to be my disciple over a human disciple. <clears throat> but you'll be making a big mistake because Christ is the one who designed the program of discipleship. And Christ is the one who wants human disciples to disciple human disciples. Is is the program that's why Christ said to, to, to his disciples, go and make disciples. He would have said, don't you worry, I will make disciples do other things. I, from heaven, will make disciples. 
but he didn't. <clears throat> he instructed human beings to make disciples because he expects a program where there is a human discipler discipling a human disciple. Very important. I've stressed this, I want to repeat it. This human disciple, discipler, must not prevent people from accessing Christ for their own discipleship. I will explain how that takes place. He must also not, not obscure Christ from the view of human disciples. Rather, he must mirror Christ. He must see Christ in his own life. Having said that, God still insists that a disciple, a disciple, I'm sorry, a disciple, yes, a disciple must have a human disciple. That's important. That's important. If we're asking you the question, who is discipling you? And you can't answer that question. We have to teach you how to find a human discipler so that you will um, diligently look for one. That's important, extremely important for you to note, for you to note. Now, when discipleship is starting in a place, it is a concept that is not known, and God is introducing discipleship in a place. He may send someone who is already a disciple who understands discipleship. Then he may recruit people uh, to come to discipleship, to, to, to be his disciples, as he's discipling them on behalf of Christ. In that instance, we will not have a one-on-one -on -one relationship between a disciple on the one hand and a disciple on the other hand. But rather what, what, what will happen is that we'll have one disciple discipling a group of people and that discipleship is collective. When one person disciples a group of people, he disciples them in two ways. He disciples them as a group in a class, like Christ had a class of disciples. John the Baptist, by the way, also had a class of disciples. So you'll have this class, you'll be discipling them and growing them, and they'll be maturing in the things of God, understanding God's program of discipleship, this group of people. And then as the discipleship expands, and they themselves are recruiting people to discipleship, then they will begin now to also have people they are discipling under the main discipler, the founder of discipleship in that area. After some time, these people are going to be released to be disciples of other lives while they are lightly discipled by the person who introduced discipleship to them lightly in the sense that when you've been in discipleship for a long time, you don't need as much, much attention as you need when you're a disciple, uh, when you're a, a, a disciple. Uh, when you are a, a recent disciple, a recent disciple requires a lot of time, a lot of time. But as he or she grows and she learns the life of Christ, 
learns the word of God, learns the principles of heaven, learns the ethical values of heaven, uh, learns the kingdom of God and how it operates, this person now will begin also to have uh, some people have classes and some people that he or she disciples. Now, I want just to know two things tonight. One, a disciple, one, discipleship requires two people here on earth, two people, a disciple and a disciple. And a disciple must make disciples in order to have disciples whom he is discipling for Christ. And he himself is a disciple of, is a disciple of Christ. So we have a discipler. And a discipler is engaged in what is known as disciple making, disciple slash making, in a disciple making project for heaven, a disciple making project for heaven. On the other hand, we've got a discipler, not a disciple one disciple or many disciples who are discipled by this disciple. It's important. Are you a discipler? Have you been discipled by someone else in the past? Is Christ continuing to refine your life, to infuse his own life in you, in causing you to be a reflector of the life of Christ? Are you? that person. On the other hand, are you a follower of Christ, either individually or as a group of people, and you are consistently uh, having classes where you learn more about Christ? Uh, God felt that this explanation was necessary. Next time then we'll talk about how does a discipler make disciples, how do disciples find a disciple? We will talk about that. We are trusting that this teaching was clear, redundant it may have been, uh, because one wanted to emphasize concepts that are very critical in discipleship. And the Lord bless you. We'll be meeting very soon when we'll be continuing with this. If you've got any questions, uh, don't hesitate to call me and ask, ask for clarification. If you've got a disciple next to you, you can go and ask them what Professor Antindili meant when he said such and such. The Lord bless you. You have access to my my uh, WhatsApp. You can send me uh, an email. The email is v v as in Vincent v ntintili n t i n t i l i v ntintili one word small letter at gmail.com. You can write to me directly and ask questions. The Lord bless you. Thank you.